Opinion polls in the USA show that for years now a majority of Americans are against the war in Afghanistan. According to a new survey done by the Washington Post and ABC, two-thirds of all Americans feel the war is not worth fighting. They're asking President Obama to pull a large portion of the troops out of Afghanistan after the end of the summer. In June, Obama had announced this year to pull out 10,000 troops. And next year, 23,000 troops are to follow. That would leave 70,000 U.S. troops in Afghanistan. In addition, there remains tens of thousands of U.S. paid mercenaries. After this reduction, American troop levels would still be larger than before Obama came to power. Our next guest is Phyllis Bennis. She is with the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., and author of the book Ending the U.S. War in Afghanistan, a Primer. Phyllis Bennis, uh, the official justification for the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan was and still is to fight terrorism. How plausible is this justification, given, for example, the fact that none of the 9-11 hijackers were from Afghanistan, but most of them from Saudi Arabia? No Afghan has been sued before court due to 9-11 up to now. Why was Afghanistan chosen to be invaded? Why not Saudi Arabia? Well, I think that the decision to attack Afghanistan was a political attack. It wasn't a strategic attack. It was preparatory to the real goal, which was the war against Iraq. But Afghanistan was the easy target, if you will. There was the claim that because the hijackers had been, uh, uh, had, had been inspired from somebody at that time in Afghanistan, that it was legitimate somehow for the entire population of Afghanistan to be this, the target of this massive war. As you say, the hijackers were not born in Afghanistan. They were born in Egypt and Saudi Arabia. They didn't live in Afghanistan. They lived in Hamburg. They didn't train in Afghanistan. They trained in Florida. And they didn't go to flight school in Afghanistan. They went to flight school in Minnesota. So there was no legitimate claim, uh, nor was this an incident of uh, of self-defense. The hijackers had been killed. There, there were no indications that there were more hijackers coming. The idea, the justification was that they, they attacked us. And then therefore we, however we want to define we, have the right to kill all of them. And this notion of us and them was very central to the ideological basis of that. The justification now is quite specific. It's to go after al-Qaeda. Now, the problem for the U.S. administration is that they've admitted that there are only somewhere between 50 and 75 members of al-Qaeda left in Afghanistan. So what you have is almost 100,000 U.S. troops, about 40, between 40 and 50,000 other NATO troops, almost 100,000 U.S. paid mercenaries in Afghanistan, to go after 75 guys? I don't think so. So this has far more to do now with both continuing the political role, making sure that the U.S. is able to uh, claim a victory at some point, although that's clearly not going to happen in any real sense. And at the strategic level, it has everything to do with the st strategic location of Afghanistan, the, the uh, uh, inability of the U.S. to occupy Pakistan, which remains a, a major uh, concern. The U.S. would love to actually declare its ongoing war against Pakistan, but it can't do that. Uh, so instead, it says it's at war in Afghanistan and uses that as the basis to go to war using drones against Pakistan. There's also the question of natural gas and oil pipelines going through Afghanistan. Uh, but basically, the war in Afghanistan is not a war for oil. It's a war for strategic positioning, which is a slightly uh, different role than the war, for example, in Iraq. Hundreds of billions of dollars are spent for the war in Afghanistan. At the same time, uh, the U.S. is facing a severe debt crisis. Talk about the costs of the war and the U.S. military budget in general. The American people right now are paying an enormous price very directly, very much at the financial level for the war in Afghanistan. At the moment that we are being told there is no money for jobs, there's no money for health care, there's no money for schools, we are somehow able to find not only $122 billion this year 
for the war in Afghanistan alone, $47 billion more for the war in Iraq, and a total of $553 billion, half a trillion dollars just this year, just for the overall Pentagon budget that doesn't even include those costs of the actual war. When you add in all the other military expenses, you're talking about over a trillion dollars of U.S. tax money that is going to this war. At a moment when we are being told that we need to have everybody uh, sacrifice, everybody needs to be prepared to give up something. The poorest people in this country need to be able to give up part of their, uh, uh, part of their social security safety net. Working people have to give up part of their pensions. Old people have to give up part of their Medicare, the only medical health care they have available. So it's a, it's a horrific reality in this country where the Afghans are paying the dramatic price in blood. People in this country are paying an enormous price in the economic crisis uh, that is affecting our country. And until very recently, the question of the costs of war has simply not been on the official agenda here in Washington. It has been front and center in the agenda of people, popular movements. If we look, for example, at the state of Wisconsin, which saw the first real uprising against these massive cuts uh, earlier this year, the state budget deficit that led to a huge cutback in uh, uh, public employees in, in Wisconsin and the threat of the unions of Wisconsin losing all rights in that state, that state budget deficit was $1.8 billion, a huge amount of money. The amount of money that the taxpayers of the state of Wisconsin, that same state that were, uh, that were losing $1.8 billion in a state budget deficit, they were paying in taxes $1.7 billion, almost the exact same amount as their share of the war in Afghanistan. So the link is very, very immediate and very, very direct. The goal now is to make that the demand of people across this country to bring the war dollars home. Your latest book, Phyllis, is called Ending the U.S. War in Afghanistan, a Primer. You're saying that pulling out the troops out of Afghanistan is not sufficient. How should a true exit strategy, in your view, look like? A true exit strategy can only start with withdrawing the troops. That's step one. That's not step all. We have an enormous debt to the people of Afghanistan. The U.S. government for 30 years has been responsible for devastation in that country. We're not the only actor, but we're by far the biggest actor who has caused and supported and funded and armed wars in these countries. And if we look at what we're leaving in Afghanistan now while we're there, you know, we hear in this country, for instance, we have to keep troops in Afghanistan because we have to protect the women. Well, let's look at what it really means for women in Afghanistan. Women in Afghanistan die too young, too often, but they don't die because they're killed by the Taliban. That's a, a very rare occurrence. They die frequently in huge numbers because they die in childbirth for lack of decent medical care. At the time that the Taliban ran Afghanistan in say the year 2000, the, the women of Afghanistan faced the worst place in the world to give birth. Afghanistan had the lowest ranking in the UN's rankings for maternal mortality, for women dying in childbirth. Where is Afghanistan today? It's still the worst place for a woman to give birth. This is not something that my country can be proud of. So we owe an enormous debt. We owe a debt that needs to be paid with money, with access to training, but not with US control. U.S. aid money now overwhelmingly does not leave the United States. It goes to U.S.-based contractors, U.S.-based agencies, U.S.-based manufacturers, U.S.-based arms dealers. We need to transform that so that money goes directly to Afghans. Will the current government in Afghanistan survive if, when, when the U.S. pulls out? I'm not sure. I think probably not because I don't think it has the independent indigenous legitimacy to survive without US uh, support. So what does that mean? Will there be chaos in Afghanistan? 
I'm afraid there probably will for a while. It's not going to be a pretty sight when the U.S. pulls out. But that's going to be true whether it's today that the U.S. pulls out, as I advocate, or whether it's in five years or ten years, as I think some in Washington would like to imagine. We need to be very clear about the role of the region. We need to support regional diplomacy. That means the entire region, not only the countries that the U.S. likes. Everybody in the region has a, a role to play in this kind of diplomacy. And there needs to be a regionally and globally supported diplomatic process inside the country, one in which the U.S., whose military functions essentially as the largest mil militia in Afghanistan today, and by far the most popular, we need to end the role of all the militias, including the U.S. Army. So once that happens, I think the possibility of a negotiated diplomatic process internally to Afghanistan will be far more viable. This was Context TV. To safeguard our independence, Context TV does not accept advertising or sponsoring. However, through a sustaining membership or a donation, you can help support us. More information at our website at www.context-tv.de. Thank you for viewing and listening. David Gösmann and Fabian Scheidler bid goodbye.